Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, we're we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, so I encourage you to, to find your place there. Philippians 4, uh, we're preaching through at uh, my church, First Baptist Chapel, preaching through Philippians on Sunday mornings, and so I always uh, want to remind really myself and all of us that the, the place of the sermon is in the, um, the place of the local church, right? Uh, uh, sermons, they ca- can be in chapel, right? But sermons weren't made for chapel. They're made for uh, congregations of... Uh, God's people. And so uh, Philippians 4, this is a, a meal, you know, exposition is a meal that uh, I shared with uh, our people uh, about four or five weeks ago, and I just want to bring that today. So Philippians 4, just two verses this morning, but uh, there's so much here. Uh, Philippians 4, 2 and 3, uh, verse 1 is a transitional uh, verse here, but I, I want us to camp on verses 2 and 3. So we'll read it, and then we'll pray for the Lord's help, and then we'll set the passage before us, Philippians For the title of the message is Coming Together in Christ. Coming Together in Christ. So Philippians 4, starting in verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Just a a brief prayer. Father, uh, help us now. Help us to always uh, remember that when we come to your word, we come to you. And just as in the same way, uh, many of our interactions with those that we love might be through text messages throughout the day, but we're not just dealing with uh, words on a, a screen or this morning words on a page. We're dealing with a person behind these words who inspired them for our good. And so we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to illumine our understanding, to ready our wills, to quicken us, that we might be changed by this passage and be better uh, Christians because of it, be, be better Christian leaders because of it. We pray for all this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> You know, sometimes, uh, perhaps many times, we kind of have a glamorized view of the early church. In that, in that right, we say things like, "Man, the early church they they had it right. Uh, the early church was so pure. Uh, the early church was so devoted. The um, the early church was so together, so passionate, so simple. I mean, they loved God. They loved uh, each other. They shared their burdens. They shared their lives. They shared their belongings. And and uh, loved ones. Much of that is true." Um, But that's not the whole story, right? The the book of Acts does paint some beautiful pictures of the early church, but Acts isn't the whole story. Uh, Me and uh, Brother Robert were talking in his office about the reason the New Testament letters exist is because the early church also had its its problems, its difficulties, its its challenges. There were divisions in Corinth. There, Paul writes, Now exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. There was heresy in Galatia. Paul writes there, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a, for a different uh, gospel. There was confusion in Ephesus. That's why Paul has to write, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works. There was uh, immorality in Thessalonica. That's why Paul has to write, For God has not called us for the purpose of immorality or impurity, but in sanctification. Right, loved ones, those verses I just referenced, they wouldn't exist unless those problems were real. And so the early church had its problems just like the current church does. And um, one of the main problems in Philippi was unity. Um, conflict. Now you should know, and I just want to draw your attention just to, to a handful of verses, that unity, the unity of this church is no small matter in this letter. If you'll turn back just to chapter 1, chapter 1 verse uh, 27, Paul writes, "...only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and, and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm." And here it comes, "...in one spirit." with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
Or, or chapter 2 that has that wonderful Christological passage about the Lord Jesus humbling self. The, the, the main purpose of that section is unity. Chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. How, Paul? How can we make your joy complete? By being of the same mind maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul wouldn't be mentioning harmony and unity and togetherness and sameness again and again and again unless they're... um, uh, unless there was a problem in this church. And really the, the, the point of this message this morning is that the church is not exempt from conflict. Now, pastors know that, right? Um, theological students maybe be, need to be aware of that, but um, wherever you, the Lord calls you to, right, there will be people. <laughs> and where there are people, there will be conflict, And here in our passage this morning, the Apostle Paul gets very practical, very personal, and even very particular. One particular area of conflict in this particular church centers on two particular ladies. You see their names there in verse 2. I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. And and listen, Lomas, it does not get more personal than this, right? For the Apostle Paul to call you out by name, in a letter, in a public setting that's going to be um, recorded and passed down for all future generations, right? Who's thankful for a closed canon this morning, right? I, I, I don't want my name to be on no, I don't want my name to be in any letters, but th- this is very, very personal. But this passage is here for our good. It's here for our good because it's, it's there to remind us what life in, in church is really like. Right? It's, it's filled with people, so therefore it's going to be filled with conflict. And so it's to show us church, warts warts and all. It's to warn us, I think, how easy it is to enter into conflict with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And and mostly it's there to encourage us to seek reconciliation between our brothers and sisters in Christ whenever and wherever um, that uh, fraction um, or fracturing happens. Okay, so here's the the main idea. I always like to set out a main idea in in front of those that I'm, I'm teaching. Every church can and must pursue harmony with one another as they follow Jesus together. Every church can and must pursue harmony with one another as we follow Jesus together. And so we're going to look at these two uh, verses with with two simple questions and, and seeking to answer them. So why is harmony in the church needed? And then where is harmony in the church found? So that's going to be our our outline. Why is uh, harmony in the church needed and where is harmony in the church found? So number one... Why is harmony in the church needed? Well, just to be blunt, it's needed because conflict exists even in the church. As I said, where people are, conflict will be. Actually, relationships are the only realm in which conflict should happen. Right? And so conflict um, will be in the church. Notice again the verses. I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women. And he, he says some, some very wonderful things about them. They, they've shared my struggle in the cause uh, of the gospel together with others in your church, like Clement and others. He calls them his fellow workers at the end of verse 3. And he says he's even confident that these women, Clement and others, are their names are in the book of, the, uh, in the book of life, which is all great things. The point is that even in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is conflict, right? Because the church is essentially made up of relationships, brothers and sisters in in Christ, right? There's going to be conflict in marriage because there's people in marriage. They should have been said amen from the corner over at least, all right? <laughs> there's, going to be, there's going to be conflict in, in homes because there's family in homes. There's going to be conflicts uh, among work because you're, you're working with people. There might be conflicts in your neighborhood because your neighbors are people. And yes, there's conflict even in the church. And I would say this um, for all of our good. I think there should be conflict especially in the church if the church is being faithful to carry out the one anothering that the New Testament puts before us. 
Right? I mean, the, the, the one anothering that the, the New Testament places on believers necessitates some pretty close relationships, some pretty regular encounters, some, some pretty open exposure of what I'm dealing with and what you're dealing with. And I really believe if we're carrying out the one anothering in the way the New Testament tells, con, uh, uh, tells us to, then conflicts are inevitable. If we're spending the, the time together necessary, if we're doing the one anothering necessary, um, we're going to get on one another's nerves. Right? I mean, the, the, the biggest potential for conflict in my life is with my wife and my son. Do you know why? Because I'm always with them. <laughs> right? and, and I'm a sinner and they're a sinner. And I, I tell them I'm the biggest problem in my house. And, and um, so conflict is inevitable, particularly in the church. And, and so the church is not exempt. And I, I just think about it in my, own, uh, my hometown, there's 3,000 people that live in my small community. 3,000 people live in Chaffee. There's 14 churches in our 3,000 member town. There's two Southern Baptist churches in my uh, local town. Uh, the other Baptist church name is Friendship. It was a, a break off of us. No. Uh, but it was a, it's a split. Right. Um, yeah. If if your church name has harmony or friendship in it, you was you were a split. I just want to let. You, um, um, now, why are there so many so many churches? Why are there so many churches within the same denomination in a community? Why are there so many churches within evangelicalism? Yes, doctrinal differences, but really the core of it comes down to to, to conflict. Why is the average pastor, at least in my denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, why is the average pastor at three and a half years? Conflict. Conflict exists in the church. So why is harmony needed? It's needed is because conflict is in inevitable. Now, the conflict here centered on two ladies. You see their names. They're both Greek names, which gives us just a little uh, insight about their, their background. Euodia, her name literally means a fragrant offering. And then Syntyche, whose name literally means uh, fortunate or, or from, from fate. And really, they're, they're words that are uh, they're, they're titles that uh, indicate blessing, right? Um, which says something about you know, their, their parents and, and what they named them. But uh, in, in more particular, these women would have been blessings to this, this church. Um, there's a right way, or I mean, there's lots of right ways and there's lots of wrong ways of handling these, uh, this situation in verse 2. But what I want to remind all of us is that the only reason that these two women's names are here is because they're so influential. And the only reason is because they're two women is because these conflicts happen to center on women. And if there were men, he would have named the, the, the men. If there were children, he would have named the, the children. Wherever there are people, there are conflict. And Paul would not signal out these women unless this issue was important and unless these women were influential. Right? The mention of these ladies in this situation only heightens how uh, influential they, they must have been to the, uh, the church. Um, that, that's why I pointed out those references in uh, verse 3, what, what Paul says about them. Uh, recognize that again because this is so important. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women. And here's what Paul says, three good things about these women. These women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel which means not surely they were prayer partners with Paul, but even more than that, they were financial um, givers to Paul, right? which says something about their status. Philippi, because it was such um, a favored Roman city, the women in that place were um, allowed more room to actually uh, reach certain levels of, of riches and influence that wasn't true everywhere within the, the, the Roman Empire. And so these were women of status that were actually able to share Paul's struggle in the cause of uh, the gospel, cause of the gospel. So I'm, I'm sure they were financial partners. He says, together with Clement, also the rest of my fellow workers. And so he, he says these women are, are um, they're in the same yoke, striving in the, in the same gospel with Paul. And then he says their names are in the book of, of life. Right? So these are not troublemakers. These are not women that are, are a, a continual, they're always in the middle of strife. No, these are... These are godly women. They're not busybodies. They're, they're godly. They're not gossips. They're, they're, they're godly. They have just somehow managed to find themselves at odds with one another. And notice that Paul doesn't signal um, uh, one of them out. He, he puts the verb in, in front of both of their names, each of their names, so that there can be no uh, miscommunication about who's at fault. Notice verse 2. I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche. 
Right? He could have just put, I urge Yodia and Syntyche. And then people might have said, well, you see who he put the who he named first. He urges, he urged Yodia, and then Syntyche just happened to follow. Now he puts the urge in front of both of their names to say each of these ladies is personally responsible for how they, they um, navigate this conflict and whether or not they'll obey this um, command. And, and it's actually... Um, it's their past faithfulness. It's these things that Paul mentioned in verse 3. They're, they're sharing in his struggle. They're, they're being a fellow uh, um, worker with Paul. It's the fact that their names, that Paul is confident that their names are in the book of life. It's all that faithfulness that actually makes this situation so, so difficult. Um, you know, even mature Christians are not exempt from personal conflict. It's not necessarily a sign of immaturity or, or even unbelief. But it's often just a sign that someone or perhaps multiple people have lost the mind of Christ. Right? That's what Paul writes in, in, in chapter 2 about. You've got to recover the mind of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the very form of God, did not recar- uh, regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped or, or held on to at all costs. But he, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself. And so notice Paul doesn't say, Kick these women out of the church. Paul doesn't say, find out who's right and then side with, with that particular lady. He doesn't even say, which most um, Christians say, just leave each other alone. Isn't that the way we avoid conflict in church? Just you go to that Sunday school class. You, go to the, you sit over here. You sit over there. Just, just make sure that you, you're just not around one another. Let, uh, let each other be. No, Paul says reconcile, help them reconcile, they, get them to live in harmony because that is the way of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of, of God. Or, or just after that in Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 5, 24, Jesus says, if you're, you're presenting your, your offering to the, the Lord, Matthew 5, 24, leave your offering there if you've noticed that something with, with your brother is off. Leave your offering there before the altar and go First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Like surely personal relationships shouldn't um, pause our worship with God. Shouldn't we worship God and then go reconcile? Shouldn't we seek God and then reconcile? Well, Jesus said that's not the way that it, that it works. You need to reconcile with your brothers and sisters so that um, you're displaying that you have the right relationship to God. Or Paul in, in Romans 12, 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, um, be at peace with all men. So harmony is necessary because conflict is inevitable. It was there in Philippi. It was in all the New Testament churches. It's here in, in your church. And just for personal application, I think your, your presence at Brooks uh, says something about the kind of church you belong to. Um, probably a church that, that has a high view of the scripture, a high view of God, and maybe you go to church with people that have been shaped by the Bible for years and years and years. But what about the church that, that you're called to? Right? Once you get your degree, once you feel the particular um, realm in which the Lord wants you to go serve, right? those people that haven't been under the type of preaching and teaching that, that, that you've been um, a privilege to, to sit under, um, conflict will, will come about. And so uh, why is uh, harmony necessary? Because conflict is uh, inevitable. That brings us to number two, which is actually the the thrust of this passage. Where is harmony found? This is the treasure of this text, uh, friends. Notice how many times in just these two verses, verse two and three, how many times Paul mentions something related to Jesus as the grounds for true harmony. Again, verse 2, he says, I urge Yodi and I urge the syndicate to live in harmony in the Lord. Verse 3, indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, which means to be in the same yoke together for the cause of the gospel. And then uh, finally, whose names are are in the book of life. So everything Paul points to as the grounds for the harmony between these sisters is found where? In the Lord Jesus. You got to have harmony in in, in the Lord. You remember you shared in the struggle of of the gospel. You've been under the same yoke working to advance uh, the gospel. Both of your names are in the the book of life. That's where harmony needs to, to, um, 
to rally. Oh, that's how you need to rally around harmony. Uh, harmony in the church is not found in um, shared preferences. Uh, real harmony. Not, it's not about your translation that you use or the, the, the worship style that you sing. Harmony in the church is not surrounded by um, likable personalities, um, generic kindness, not even the absence of conflict. That's not where harmony is found in the absence of conflict. No, harmony is found by remembering um, whatever differences true brothers and sisters have in Christ, whatever difference, differences we may have, uh, we always have more in common in the Lord Jesus. True Christians, and that's an important qualifier, true Christians always have more in common than we, we do uh, that would divide us from our brothers and sisters in, in Christ. Now, I just want to make a side note here because um, we don't have harmony at, at the cost of truth. Right? I mean, there's sometimes conflict needs to happen, and sometimes divisions need to happen. Actually, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians, that the reason there's divisions is so you can know who's right and who's, who's wrong. Right? It's uh, you know, a, a famous Southern Baptist of old, Adrian Rogers, used to say, I'd rather be divided uh, over truth than united in error. And so there is time where you need to say, listen, these differences make a difference. These differences matter, and, and, and if, uh, these differences actually make you not a Christian or me um, not a Christian, but true Christians can always find real harmony in the Lord. And notice Paul doesn't mention, he, doesn't, uh, he leaves out the specifics of the disagreement, right? Wouldn't you love a, a, another verse in there about the actual specifics? That shows how sinful we are. You know, let me know what they're actually, he, he, he doesn't talk about the specifics of their disagreement because that wouldn't be uh, helpful. It would miss the point and it would be a di distraction, because it doesn't matter what the difference is as long as they are both truly in the Lord. If, if that is a true brother or sister in Christ, if you are, are truly pursuing the gospel as your highest priority, and that person is pursuing the gospel as their highest priority, if your name is truly in the book of life and my name is truly in the book of life, then we can have harmony. Right, and I love that the, the Paul mentions this, this book of life at the end of verse uh, three, or, yeah, 3, whose names are in the book of life. You know what this book is, right? This book of, of life, it's, who's in this book? All those that are going to be in heaven. Right? All those that are going to be in heaven forever together. And Paul's point is, you're going to be in, in heaven together forever. Why don't you get along now? Right? That reconciliation that Christ bought and paid for on the cross display that reconciliation, that new family in, in today. Reflect that future forever harmony today. I, 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 I don't know if it's just providence or whether or not, you know, um, Brother Robert just likes sitting next to me, but in chapel, he's always singing next to me and he's always singing harmony. Right? And I love that. I, I'm not very good at, at singing harmony. But you know how harmony works. We're not singing on the same notes, but we're, we're singing on the same page. We're singing together. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing for us to, to have harmony with one another in, in the Lord Jesus. And you know any uh, band players in here, instruments, trumpet? I was a trumpeteer. What do you play? Euphonium. What is that? Tuba. Tuba. What was that first word you said? Euphonium. Euphonium that, that's a made-up word. That doesn't <laughs> exist. Uh, <laughs> You know uh, how instruments stay in tune together, right? They have to have a common, you know, a tuning fork. They have to have a common place of being in, in tune. Well, Paul says in the church of the Lord Jesus that harmony is in, in him. And, and I want you to notice that sometimes harmony, um, for harmony to happen, actually requires the assistance of an outside party. Well, that's the heart of verse 3. Don't miss it. Indeed, true companion... If you're reading, you know, um, commentators or, or scholars, there, uh, some people believe companion is actually a proper name. So this actual person's name, Paul is referencing, his name is companion. And Paul says, well, live up to your name and be a true companion. But whether or not that's his, his name or not, that's not the point. Indeed, true companion, this third party, I ask you, use the singular, is in the singular. I'm asking you, this third neutral party, you need to step in and help these women. Help these women come together. Sometimes you need a mediator to help. Even mature Christians like Euodia and Syntyche need a mature third party to come in, come in and, and, and help. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's Matthew 18, right? You, you, you go to your brother or sister first, alone, in private, and you talk about this, this matter that needs to be reconciled. And sometimes if, if you can't reconcile with, with just you and that other person, what are you, what are you commanded to do? Well, go, go find another witness. You got to bring another party in. Sometimes reconciliation won't take place just because I'm a Christian and you're a Christian. I'm a mature Christian and, and, and you're a mature Christian. Sometimes we need that, that helpful peacemaker, that, that counselor, that friend, that, that bridge builder. And love us, if you think that uh, harmony in the church is not something you're going to have to deal with, you're so naive it makes me pity you. Because churches have real struggles because they're made of real people. And if there was conflict in Philippi and conflict in Corinth and conflict in, in, in Thessalonica, why do you think there's going to be conflict at Chaffee? Or what, what's the name of this church? South County. South County Bible Church. No, because where there are people, there will be conflict. And the command is not to, to keep conflict by separating one another and just leave each other alone and, and, and pick your sides and just be generically kind, right? And I think there's so many Christians that think that we, I, I get along with everybody. And the reason you think you get along with everybody, because every, th- every person in your life that has the potential to get on your nerves, you cut them out, right? Isn't that true? Don't, don't we do that? The people that are hard to get along with, people that personalities don't match up with you, people that have maybe a different sense of humor than you or a different uh, uh, Christian lifestyle to you, maybe they, they have uh, different lines than you. We say, well, I just cut those people in my life and then actually think that I'm getting along with everybody. That's not the, the vision of the church that, that Jesus um, has. That's not the, the church that Jesus um, paid for. Well, let's get to the conclusion. Um, let's get to the, the, the you. Who might you, not somebody else, who might you need to reconcile with? Somebody that, for whatever reason, you've, you've cut them out of your, your circle. Um, that's not the call of the gospel, to, to cut people out of the circle that are, that are truly brothers or sisters. Um, that, that's not the call of the true one-anothering of the church. Do the one-anothering with people that are like you and, and uh, you can get along with easily. No. Um, reconcile. In the, the, in the wisdom of the Lord Jesus, he built in a, a regular checkpoint for all of us to gauge our, our unity in the church. What was the built-in checkpoint that, that Jesus put on a regular basis that churches uh, enter into to check our, our unity? The Lord's Supper, the table. Right, that, that's that, and I don't know how uh, regularly, uh, regularly your church might do that. I, I have good friends that do it every week. We do it uh, the first Sunday every month. Maybe your church does it every uh, quarter. But that, in, in one sense, that is a built-in checkpoint regarding unity in your church. Reconcile with that person you need to reconcile with before the next time you, you partake of that meal. Because we, we come to that table not simply as a believing people and a faithful people, hopefully, and a repenting people, but we're supposed to come as a united people. Right? I mean, that's the whole, like the, the, the passage, 1 Corinthians, that we read every time we, we partake the Lord's uh, Supper. That, the, sin, the essential problem there is what? Disunity. People are, 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 um, are rushing to get to the table first and not leaving some for, the, for their brothers and sisters. That's not the church Jesus died for. He died for a united people. One bread, one cup, one Lord, one family. So I just tell you this morning, you know, come together in, in Jesus. Where does the reconciliation Jesus accomplished on the cross need to be displayed in your life, in my life, in a particular relationship? And listen to what Paul says here. You make the first move. I'm urging you, Yodia, and I'm urging you, Syntyche. Don't wait for the other person. You make the first move. You humble yourself first. You recover the mind of Christ regardless of what the other person does so that the church of the Lord Jesus might stand as a united uh, people. Let's just close by reading uh, again chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, which is the very heart of this matter. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Man, wouldn't that fix some unity problems? Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Wouldn't that fix some problems? Have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for us.
Father, we're, we're thankful for um, our short time gathered around uh, this word. I'm so thankful for uh, the words of uh, the president here that, that we don't come here just because it's a it's Tuesday and chapel's on Tuesday and it's it's on the schedule. We come here because we we need these times together around your uh, word. Father, we need more of the Bible being poured through us. We need more commands from Scripture being laid in front of us that we might be the people that you've called us to be. Father, I pray just in a very personal, practical level that you'd put someone in my heart and my mind, someone in, in, in the hearts and minds of every person here, someone that they need to seek to be um, a true one another with in the gospel so that they can actually have the joy of bearing burdens and even have the joy of navigating conflict because you know the relationship's actually going somewhere. Father, it's so easy to not have any conflict with the people that we just run into on a, uh, on a, on a frequent basis. I don't have conflict with the, the person at the gas station I stop at every day. I don't have conflict with my, my waiter at my favorite restaurant. And I see those people all the time. Conflict can only come up in certain relationships, real relationships, vulnerable relationships. Father, help us to be Christians and to belong to churches that navigate harmony well as we carry out the one anothering of the New Testament. We pray for all this in Christ's name. Amen.